Hi, I'm Brian Vines, and this is 112BK. Coming up, a show about the body and a man on a campaign to keep it intact. Foreskin, it's in our DNA. Nature mm -hmm. intended us to have it. It's there for a reason. It's part of what makes us human. And then new findings about the medical device industry and how too many people are being hurt by problematic implants. The show's theme today is the body, specifically alterations that people make to the body. Two of the most common ones, circumcision and augmentation. We've got a reason to talk about both. Augmentation because a report was just released by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists on the medical device industry, with more troubling findings that faulty implants are endangering millions of patients. But first, we're going to talk about circumcision. These days, it's being done less in the U.S. It used to be about 80% of the male population. Now, it's down to 57%. Here in Brooklyn, there's a group that would like to make that number zero. Circumcision is most prevalent in Jewish and Muslim communities. Jews because it's believed to be a commandment from God while Muslims believe Muhammad was circumcised and the practice is mentioned in recordings of his words or affirmations. But like all articles of blind faith, this one's being called into question. To hear an argument for the intact body, I was recently joined by the founder of the Brooklyn-based action group, Intaction, Anthony Lasquardo. Here's that conversation. So, Anthony, without getting into what is south of your belt line, what got you on the road to intaction? Well, uh, Brian, first of all, thanks for having me here Absolutely. today. Uh, you know, when I started intaction uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, I, I felt that we needed to really let people know, Americans know, why foreskin is awesome and why sh they should want it and why, sh why it's an important, uh, an important part of our anatomy. So we've said intaction already twice. That would be the third mention. What exactly is that? Well, it's the name of our organization. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, and uh, the name means uh, promoting uh, the intact body mm -hmm. and taking action. We're a very uh, action-oriented organization. We like to be out there talking to people yeah. and making change happen. So you're an action-oriented organization. Who was calling out for this action? What is your constituency? Who are the people? Is it a silent majority, a suffering minority? Who are the people in the intaction army? Uh, it's thousands of men and women, uh, mostly in the United States, but around the world, that believe that uh, people's bodies should not be changed unless it's done by the persons whose body it is and consents to it. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, too many children are having parts of their body cut off. And, uh, and, and our army is all of the men, women, parents uh, from all around the world that want to uh, see that this practice uh, is reduced or so ended. So do you have a problem with circumcision as it stands or just the way that it's performed by and large in America? Uh, I, we want to promote the intact body and the, and the benefits of it. And uh, I think once people understand how important the foreskin is, they won't want to cut it off. So the Center for Disease Control and the American Pediatric Academy, they've both come down on the side of recommending that young men from the time they're born have this procedure performed. What do you know that those two organizations don't? Actually, those organizations are more in line to our way of beliefs than you might think, because that's not what the headlines. That's not their recommendation. Well, uh, that's not what the headlines report. Uh -huh. Now, uh, the headlines say that say one thing, but when you read through the studies and their reports, it says something else. I, I hate to get into all this technical detail because I don't uh, want. We got a minute. I don't want to bore all your your <laughs> viewers, but for instance, the 2012 American Academy of Pediatric C Circumcision Policy Statement said the benefits were slight, the risks are unknown. And it's not a recommendation for circumcision, but only parents should have the option, mostly for cultural reasons, to perform it if they want. And most important thing, insurance companies should pay for it. You have to understand the AAP 
is first and foremost a trade association. Mm -hmm. Does it, there to protect doctors' incomes, not babies' bodies. So they're in the pocket of big circumcision. They're in the pocket of insurance reimbursements and billable income. Now, a, the main author of the policy statement, Dr. Andrew Friedman, mm -hmm. and I've spoken to him, and he wrote an article uh, a year later, and he said that the data is conflicting, it goes back and forth both ways. Both sides of the, of the issue are gonna promote their talking points on the medical data, but mm -hmm. the, the real thing is they want to protect parents' rights to do it if they want to for cultural reasons. It really has nothing to do with medical. So why do you think circumcision is so popular in America? Because everyone who gets circumcised is not doing it for religious reasons. Well, it's really not that popular. You know, the last data we have from 2012 nationwide showed a 57 percent mm -hmm. circumcision rate. In New York City, the rate is even lower than that. So it's not as popular as you might think. Uh, but it really started over 100 years ago when people like Dr. Kellogg and other medical advocates of the day thought that masturbation was a really harmful thing for little boys. Mm -hmm. And they thought by removing the foreskin, since it's so sensitive, that that would discourage that practice. And then later on, they came up with other cures like it prevented typhus and it prevented polio and it prevented constipation and it prevented orthopedic problems. Well, fast forward to right now from the time of Dr. Kellogg, we've seen uh, some research and certainly some proponents saying it helps to diminish the rates of HIV, it uh, reduces bacteria, and for female partners, it lowers their risk of uh, getting a cervical cancer because men have a reduced risk of transferring HPV to them. So those numbers are out there. Do you uh, stop in the face of those? No, those are all disputed. You know, those are arguments. They're red her herring arguments. Mm -hmm. You know, I could show you studies that shows dark chocolate prevents cancer, and I could show you that two glasses of wine will protect you from a heart attack. Okay, so these are all pop science studies. You have to look into Europe, where the men are almost 99% intact in Europe, mm -hmm. and they have lower STD rates, lower HIV infections, lower cervical cancer rates than we have here in the United States. So if the United, of, of men in the United States where we have a higher rate of circumcision, how come we're not getting those benefits? So that is a valid question, but they also continue to have more studies that are emerging about how having a circumcised penis will protect you against those things, including certain cancers that men experience. Uh, penile cancer is so rare, you have a better chance of being hit by lightning. And if you wash your penis uh, once in a while, your chances of penile cancer are astronomically small. Uh, men in Europe do not have high rates of penile cancer. So why are you pushing an elephant up a hill with this if you have these numbers that refute the other side's numbers and people continue to be circumcised to the tune of, what, 33% of the world's population? I'm sorry, could you rephrase that question? I'm saying, why is it so difficult then if you have these numbers and these data that, to your opinion, aren't just tangential and looking at the rates in Europe versus America, why is it so hard to get the message out then? Why oh, do it's people not, it's continue it's to be circumcised at the rate they are? It's not, the rates are dropping substantially. Well, you mentioned Europe and the fact that 99% of those guys remain intact and you use New York as a sort of corollary, but we know that New York has some of the most varied uh, people from all over the world in the population. So that might have something to do with the numbers that we see here in our city in particular. Yeah, we surveyed people in New York. Mm -hmm. We did our own survey. And over 80% in our survey said that if they had a son tomorrow, they wouldn't circumcise him. And, th and also with that same number, they thought that the, the foreskin added a lot of sensitivity and a lot of benefits to, to, to men uh, later in life when they become sexually active. So uh, circumcision rates are dropping. Uh, su substantially, yeah. public attitudes are shifting. So I don't see it as uh, as uh, pushing an elephant up a hill. I see it as we have the wind to our back and it's propelling us to lower circumcision right. rates. We believe we're gonna get circumcision rates in America as low as they are in Europe in the near future. So what's it gonna take to put you out of business then? Uh, what's it gonna, I, I think there's always gonna be some type of uh, human, uh, uh, need or desire to cut children's genitals for some reason, whether it's female or male. Mm -hmm. There seems to be something that 
I don't know if it's control or what it is that adults feel the need to tamper with the children's genitals. Yeah. So I think our advocacy is always going to continue to some extent. But uh, by what we're doing is promoting the, the, the benefits of foreskin, what we call the four powers of foreskin. You know, the foreskin provides pleasure, protection, lubrication, and connection. Mm -hmm. And we're finding now parents of intact children are coming to us and saying, can you give us some literature that we can show to our sons to help build their confidence and help build body positivity? And we, provide, we created this piece of literature. Uh, it's a comic strip. It's age appropriate for teens, yeah. and it's called D "Intact Dude's Guide to Foreskin Superpowers," and and parents are loving this to give out to their kids. Right. And because uh, you're the weird guy in gym class when 99 percent of your class is cut. And yeah, you're well, the again, not 99, yeah. more like 56 percent. Oh, but yeah. uh, it discusses uh, the benefits of having foreskin, and and this type of thing is really popular uh, at our events, and we, we we give them out. So you are out there proselytizing, keeping young men intact. We're educating. Educating, even. Educating, absolutely. So to what end? Uh, you know, we want to see that the next generation has an intact body and all the benefits that it provides. You know, foreskin, it's in our DNA. Nature mm -hmm. intended us to have it. It's there for a reason. It's part of what makes us human. By taking that away, you're depriving a person of, of this important part of their anatomy. So what inspired you to take up this fight? Well, you know, when I was a, a, a young child, I went to Europe and I went to Florence, Italy, and I saw the Renaissance statues, uh, the statues of artists there, like Michelangelo's David. Yeah. And, and, you know, these sculptures were portrayal of, of the beauty and symmetry of the human body and it was supposed to be the, you know, the, the, the ultimate of, of what the human body could be, an expression of the artist's talent also. But these statues all had intact penises. And I thought as a child, why does, if this is supposed to be perfection, why do we look different from that? And then later on in life, I was in the military, and s some of my buddies were born in other countries, and they were intact. And I thought to myself again, why are the Americans one way and, and these guys are the other. Why, why was this cut off of us? And, and later on, I started to research this and get more information, and I realized that this is a major issue here, that wh why, and why don't people want to talk about it? Have you ever heard what is, in your opinion, a valid argument for circumcision? The only valid argument would be if the person's of an adult age and they can consent. That's a, if, if somebody is an adult says, you know what, I really don't like this mm -hmm. and I want to change my body. Like any cosmetic surgery or a piercing or a tattoo. I have tattoos, but nobody forced them on me, okay? So that would be a valid argument. I, we have no, no issues. I have no issues with if somebody wants to do it as an adult. Uh, the, the, the medical reasons, when we look at data in Europe, less than 2% uh, less than of the men ever needed for a medical reason, mm -hmm. for a legitimate le medical reason. It, it can tear, things can go wrong like any body part, and, and they have to treat it. But outside of that, there's no need to cut it off. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thank you, Brian. While we're on the subject of body autonomy and consent over what happens to our bodies, a new investigation by the ICIJ, that's the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, has found that the amount of women who are reporting injuries after breast implants is skyrocketing. Why? Well, that's today's issue on the table. Breast implants aren't new. In fact, the first successful augmentation happened in 1962 when Timmy Jean Lindsay of Texas was the first to be implanted with a silicone-filled bag. It was all good in the neighborhood until she started to face deteriorating health issues caused by the implant. Now, most women who receive breast implants report being satisfied with the devices, studies show. And the FDA says the risks are, quote, sufficiently well understood for women to make informed decisions about their use, unquote. But until recently, ICIJ found the FDA has allowed breast implant companies to hide the extent of harm caused 
from the public. The FDA itself warns that as many as one in five women who receive breast implants will get them removed within a decade due to complications like rupture, deflation, and the painful contraction of scar tissue around the implant, known as capsular contracture. Yikes. For years, the FDA has allowed breast implant companies to bury evidence of ruptures and other injuries by reporting them as routine events that did not require public disclosure. So when the FDA tightened enforcement of reporting rules in 2017, reports of injuries soared. Surprise, surprise. Now, a link is being drawn between systemic illness, autoimmune diseases, and exposure to the materials in these implants. Now, there hasn't been a completed study of these claims, but patient trends and a tighter reporting of issues surrounding the practice are showing us that the salesmen have taken control of the industry at the expense of patient health and the informed choices we can make about our bodies and how we treat them. That's the show for today. Next week, we're back with some great conversations about the pink tax and Facebook's smear of Soros and Color of Change. You won't want to miss that. Bye now.